Okay, welcome everyone to our third uh, Ask a Guarnica Bay Scientist webinar. Uh, we're lucky tonight to have Dr. Doug Zemeckis with us, and he's going to talk about the fisheries in Barnica Bay. First, I just want to do a few housekeeping announcements. Um, we are going to take questions, and uh, Doug will pause about halfway to take some questions, and then again at the end. So please uh, don't be shy. Type, type in your questions in the chat. We prefer the chat. There's also a Q&A feature. The chat, though, you know, is kind of works better for us. So if you look at the bottom of the screen that you're seeing, you'll see um, a row of icons and the chat is the one that has like a little talk bubble in it if you haven't used it before. And you're all muted. So, you know, please enter your questions in the chat. Um, and at the end, we're going to ask you please to do an evaluation. Uh, towards the end, I'll put, I'll put a link to um, the evaluation that you can um, reply. We'd really appreciate it. It helps improve the programs in the future. Um, so again, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Zemeckix, and um, take it away. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Karen, Jim, and others from the Barney Bay Partnership. I appreciate the opportunity to present as a part of this series. Uh, share some of my knowledge related to fisheries in Barney Bay, uh, uh, providing an overview of the biology assessment and management. I'm going to start off, uh, We, as Karen mentioned, as you guys signed up, we have an hour here this evening. I'm going to start off with uh, an overview of New Jersey's marine fisheries and then hone in on some of the key species uh, in Barnegat Bay, wrecking commercial fisheries, uh, notably hard clams. And then once I get through that, we'll pause and uh, take some Q&A at that time. That should be about halfway through. Uh, Jim Vasilides is also here. He's going to help with some of the questions in the chat, but then I'll work through them on the break. And then the second half, I'll talk about the biology assessment and management of summer flounder and striped bass. So hopefully, uh, and then I'll be happy to take as many Q&A uh, as we have energy and interest at the end of the presentation. So I uh, wish we were all able to be together in person, uh, but at least we have this uh, intermediate step of uh, remote uh, connectedness during the pandemic. So I also have my contact information here at the bottom and at the last screen uh, slide, if anyone has any follow-up questions uh, after this evening's session. So. Uh, here we are, dive in. So, uh, first, a little bit of who I am, a uh, background, who I'm working for. Um, many are probably aware of Rutgers University. I work within the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. We've been around since 1880 as the experiment station. Uh, the core and our roots, pun intended, are in commercial agriculture. Uh, we're here to fill, fulfill the land grant mission of serving the state of New Jersey through research and education. Increasingly, also in topics related to environment and natural resources, I fall in with fisheries and aquaculture, and we also have programming in food, nutrition, and health, home, lawn, and garden, and youth and community development. So we're doing research and education. The education arm is then where I fall in as well, Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Uh, since 1914, we've had faculty and staff throughout the state of New Jersey to meet the needs of stakeholders to improve lives and communities through science-based information or extending the state university out into the communities. And it's a two-way street where we identify the needs of local stakeholders and address it through research if it has not been addressed in previous work. It's cooperative on many universities, state and federal levels, but also county where I'm based uh, here, where I presume most are in Ocean County in Toms River. And I work in Ocean Atlantic and Monmouth counties focusing in on fisheries and aquaculture. So most of the folks this evening are probably generally familiar with the geography of the Jersey Shore, uh, the diversity of ecosystems, uh, estuarine, near shore, offshore uh, ecosystems, and fisheries, both rec and commercial. Some fisheries that happen within our local estuaries and some that happen uh, with fishermen from New Jersey traveling hundreds of miles. As I mentioned, I'll provide a quick overview of our major fisheries in New Jersey and then hone in on some of the more popular or what I thought might be the most interesting of species that are commonly caught in Barnegat Bay, uh, probably most uh, focused and near and dear to those parts of folks who signed up for this uh, webinar series through, uh, through the partnership. Uh, but one thing I'd like to I'll continue theme uh, is that the diversity of the fisheries and the species uh, that are caught in Barnegat Bay, some are very local, hard clams the example, uh, not really moving any migrating, uh, just up and down in the sand and sediment. Uh, whereas I'll talk about summer flounder and striped bass and 
those species that come into Barnegat Bay can migrate uh, a couple hundred miles and come back into Barnegat Bay. So uh, try to hit on diversity of biology and therefore fisheries management as well of species that are commonly targeted by fisheries in Barnegat Bay. So we have we are one of the top seafood producing states from wild capture fisheries in the country. We have some of the top ports, uh, Belford, Point Pleasant, Barnegat Light, Atlantic City, Cape May are the top ones in the state of New Jersey. And all total commercial fishing and the seafood industry have a $2.1 billion value added to the state of New Jersey. So a sizable industry, over 31,000 jobs um, from commercial fishing and seafood processing in the state. Uh, the ex vessel price, or those who are more familiar with agriculture, the farm gate price, or the value of commercial seafood to the boat, uh, this 10 year time span uh, ranges up to about 220 million. Um, multiply that by five or six, and you get the economic impacts uh, of that seafood then being caught, processed, and going to market. The other slide I just presented includes the processing of seafood that's harvested elsewhere and brought to New Jersey. Our most valuable fishery in the last decade or so has been the commercial sea scallop fishery. Folks are probably familiar with the adductor mussels on their dinner plates, but here's a large adult sea scallop. They're caught with dredges on 50 foot or larger vessels, 20 to 200 miles from the coast. Uh, many scallopers do leave from Barnegat Light, Viking Village docks uh, within Ocean County, Barnegat Bay, uh, but these are caught offshore. Similarly, the next most valuable fishery is a surf clam ocean quahog. Uh, we do see some surf clams uh, within Barnia Bay, but the fishery is uh, prosecuted uh, further offshore, uh, five, 10 miles or uh, all the way up to George's Bank off Cape Cod. More locally, the most valuable commercial fishery within Barnia Bay today is probably the blue crab fishery, uh, which is throughout Barnia Bay and also a more sizable component in Delaware Bay. As you notice, those were all shellfish. We finally get to a thin fish. Uh, number four is uh, summer flounder or fluke. Uh, this uh, sci-fi looking creature here is a monkfish. And people are often surprised number six in Jersey is actually lobster fishery. Uh, we're towards the southern extent of their range, but uh, we have lobsters even a few miles from the beach uh, with some commercial fishermen throughout the state. Uh, in addition to the commercial fisheries, we have uh, very popular and socioeconomically important recreational fisheries, uh, party boats that take uh, up to 50, 100 passengers, charter boats for smaller groups, private anglers, and shore-based surf anglers, which are about half of the anglers and half of the trips in the state. So a lot of shore-based fishing, uh, both in the bay, bays and on the oceanfront surf. Uh, the total value added from recreational fishing is approximately $1.2 billion over 16,000 jobs. Uh, and that includes all the expenditures on fishing tackle, ice, boat, and fuel. So a lot of equipment goes into it and I'll, about a million anglers a year participate in saltwater fishing. So very popular and that's, that's statewide, uh, but of course in Barnia Bay uh, and uh, the near shore waters, uh, very common uh, recreational activity, uh, fishing for shellfish, notably hard clams and uh, different fin fish species. Uh, this table here, I'll just walk through it, uh, summarize. This shows the uh, number of fish harvested or released by anglers in New Jersey from 2006 through 2015. Just using this to highlight the most commonly captured species by recreational anglers in Jersey, not necessarily the most valuable. Uh, summer flounder is the top uh, in terms of numbers, arguably also value. Uh, black sea bass is number two. Don't see too many of those within the estuaries, more nearshore and offshore waters. Uh, they like rocky reefs and wreck habitat. Bluefish is number three in uh, terms of numbers, and that is one that we do see in Barnia Bay uh, early spring through the, uh, through the fall, taking up residence in Barnia Bay. Striped bass, number four, most popular. That's one of which I'm gonna be speaking about later today. Uh, again, another common species uh, seen uh, in Barnia Bay in nearshore waters. And to tog or blackfish, uh, again, another structure associated species. See some juveniles within the estuaries, uh, uh, but most of them are in the near shore waters uh, hanging out on the artificial reefs and rock piles. So, with the great uh, high socioeconomic value in terms of jobs, uh, the cultural fabric of New Jersey's shoreline, and also seafood production, 
Uh, it's important that these marine fishery resources are responsibly managed and utilized. And uh, what could be a year long graduate science course on fisheries management, boiling it down here uh, to the 101 of fisheries management. Uh, ideally, there are systems in place to collect data on how many fish are caught and released as well by rec and commercial fisheries uh, to quantify the fishery catch, uh, the scientific observations and biological factors. Shellfish and finfish are living animals, obviously. They grow, they reproduce, some of them migrate. Uh, we need to know that type of information if you want to uh, manage a fishery that might well catch them locally uh, throughout the year and across many different habitats. Uh, these types of data go into stock assessment models, which estimate uh, the status of the population. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it healthy? Uh, is it a sustainable proportion of the population being caught? Uh, based upon where you are in terms of how many fish are estimated to be in the ocean, fin or shellfish, uh, that information is used to set uh, catch targets or management measures and how many uh, fin fish or shellfish can be harvested. And fishery managers then make regulations, uh, hopefully based upon uh, robust science that includes these different uh, main corners. Uh, for species that are local and don't migrate out of state waters in New Jersey, such as hard clams and blue crabs, they're managed at a state level by New Jersey DEP Division of Fish and Wildlife. For species that migrate along the coast between states beyond three miles, which moves from state to federal waters, that brings in other fisheries management that have a regional or coastwide um, responsibilities. The Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, as an example, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission from Maine to Florida, um, and the NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service. So depending upon uh, the life history and biology of species that that then dictates uh, basically who gets involved and who's uh, responsible and coordinating the science oftentimes, but particularly the management. So stock assessment involves estimating the health of a fishery population, looking at things like the stock, uh, the biomass, how many fish or fin or shellfish are out in the ocean, um, the age and size composition, and there are a lot of small, old, uh, small young fish, a lot of old, uh, large animals, what their reproductive capacity is, how many females there are, how many eggs they produce, uh, mortality from fishing, old age, uh, stock size, as I mentioned, and recruitment. Uh, they say, uh, there's an old saying that stock assessment is like counting trees in a forest, but pretend that the trees are moving like fish are, and they're underwater so you can't see them. So it's actually inherently very difficult. Uh, the boiling it down to the ABCs, uh, research surveys are done to get an idea of the abundance, the A and the ABCs, of uh, what surveys say are available in estuaries, near shore and offshore waters. Uh, studies are done on the biology of the species, look at their growth, mortality and reproduction, and systems are set up to estimate fishery catch, both rec and commercial. And this is essentially what goes into estimating uh, fishery resource populations and stock assessments. You have the biomass, say in 2015, if you wanna know what it is in 2016, you subtract what was caught in the fishery, what died due to natural causes, whether it be old age, predation by other animals or disease. Uh, humans are not the only ones who catch diseases, uh, fish do as well. Uh, the population can grow by animals getting older and larger or recruitment or new babies into the population. So this simply is a crash course on uh, what is often pretty complex statistical models that uses types of information to estimate how many fish are in the ocean uh, could be locally, as we'll see with hard clams, or it could be coastwide, as with summer flounder. And that's the type of information that is used to guide coastal and state uh, fisheries management. So I'll start off um, uh, moving to hard clams after this example species. Pause for some questions, but uh, hopefully folks may or may not be familiar with hard clams. Uh, they have uh, long been a popular species uh, caught by recreational and commercial fishermen in and around Barnegat Bay. Uh, this is um, a, a figure from a report, Hillman and Kenish, 1984, The Ecology of Barnegat Bay. Uh, they had a chapter in this book about the fisheries of Barnegat Bay. It shows the metric tons of landings of hard clams from 1950 through 1980. Uh, the solid line is New Jersey. The dashed line is our focus here of Barnegat Bay. 
But this was one of the top fisheries in terms of volume and landings. Uh, 1951 was estimated to be 400 metric tons, and metric tons is a little over 2,000 pounds. Uh, so a sizable harvest uh, coming out of Barnegat Bay. Um, so a long history of uh, and culture and industry built around uh, hard clam fishery in this location. A bit about the biology. So the NOAA National Marine Fish Service has some uh, neat uh, websites on hard clam, which is also known as Northern Quahog. The scientific names Mercenaria Mercenaria or Money Money Clams. Um, and uh, NOAA Fish Watch as well provides guidance on seafood selections based upon sustainability uh, and health con health concerns. So um, some neat references you can check out. But adult hard clams for those who may not already be familiar and participate in the fishery. Um, adults are uh, less than three inches. They can reach up to five inches. Uh, they have thick gray shells. Uh, the inner shell has white violet markings, not shown here, but um, the more violet markings, the more the shells were worth when these were used to be traded uh, amongst the Native Americans uh, for as currency, hence the money, money shells. Um, the population has declined as I'll show uh, briefly coming up. Um, so that has shifted the hard clams on the commercial side from wild capture to largely, largely aquaculture production. Uh, and those have uh, natata markings. So um, you can get a keen eye for that. You can tell the difference uh, generally if, uh, between what you might buy in the market, that'd be farm raised versus wild. Uh, of course, hard clams are shellfish, uh, bivalve mollusks. They have a, a hinged shell, bivalve since they have two valves or two shells. Um, they have relatively slow growth rates. They can live up to 12 to 20, about 12 to 20 years on average. Uh, this suggests the oldest is uh, 40 years. It's very old hard clam. Uh, adults are sessile, sessile or sedentary. Uh, they move vertically up and down in the sediment in which they live, but very little, if any, horizontal movement. So when they settle, um, they can move vertically uh, based upon temperature and feeding and timing of spawning, uh, but they don't really move horizontally. And uh, they're skipping down the bottom, their fecundity or the number of eggs they can produce. The females produce between one to five million eggs each spawning uh, event. So a uh, high number of eggs, high fecundity in this species. Uh, they prefer man, uh, mud and sandy substrate and saltier waters, as we'll see coming up. You generally find them in Barnegat Bay in higher numbers closer to the inlets, uh, 20 to 30 parts per thousand. The salinity of seawater, the global average is 32. Uh, so uh, when you get further from the mouth of the Barnegat Inlet, for example, up by Manilokan, salinity is below 20 parts per thousand and few hard clams. Um, not ideal conditions for them based upon salinity, but also tidal movement. Uh, algae or the phytoplankton, hard clams are filter feeders. They feed off the algae in the water. Uh, so they uh, hopefully will settle in a location that has uh, adequate food for them to filter because they can't move, chase more, and also need dissolved oxygen to live and respire just like we do on land. Uh, getting at, I uh, mentioning their ideal habitat is 60 to 80 degrees uh, and need the sweet spot of some of these parameters of salinity, water quality, and also tidal currents. And uh, they reach market size at two years or longer uh, in terms of the ones in the wild uh, or that equivalent or longer of being produced for aquaculture as well. So in terms of the, uh, that's biology. Now the assessment of uh, hard clams, it's done by the NGDEP Division of Fish and Wildlife Bureau of Shell Fisheries. They do periodic surveys with hydraulic clam dredges you see here all along the coast of New Jersey. Uh, the last time they were out in Barnegat Bay was 2012, 2013, uh, right before and shortly after Hurricane Sandy. So they're due up for another survey, but this provides an idea when they survey throughout the estuary where hard clams are and their abundance. And you can see here showing from Seaside Park to about Barnegat Inlet, uh, the locations, the white are where they didn't catch any hard clams, the gray are low abundance, and then moving up to moderate and high red and green being the highest. You see them in increasing abundance as you get closer to the higher salinity waters that enter from the ocean at Barnegat Light Inlet. Uh, and then you're seeing Barnegat Light Inlet south to Surf City, a part way down Long Beach Island, get an idea of where they're located uh, uh, in space. Uh, and also in time, the 2012 survey uh, was compared to the 1985-1986 survey uh, and they're through this type of approach, they can provide an estimate 
of actually how many animals are in the system. And they saw a 23% decrease over this period of almost 30 years, 177 million down to 136 million estimated in 2012. Um, some of the factors contributing to the declines are overexploitation, habitat degradation, whether it be uh, on the benthic habitat or declines in water quality, uh, perhaps also warming and shifts in the algae and habitat that they will survive best in, and maybe also some increases in predators, whether it be cow nose rays or blue crabs. So quite a few stressors on the hard clams. Um, working to help restore the population, Reclaim the Bay, a local nonprofit, as well as Division of Fish and Wildlife, have enhancement and restoration efforts uh, to hopefully rebuild, help rebuild the population while also maintaining the fisheries that are still active. When fishing for hard clams, record commercial, you have to end doing aquaculture farming. You have to consider the water quality, given that shellfish are filter feeders to filter in the water. Uh, so they are more prone to picking up any uh, contaminants that might be present than fin fish, which are not filter feeders and are more mobile generally. Uh, and also uh, shellfish, uh, hard clams included, can sometimes be eaten raw. So uh, public health concerns of where they may be harvested and then consumed. Um, the NJDDP Bureau of Marine Water Monitoring has been, is part of the National Shellfish Sanitation Program, amongst other entities within DEP, uh, and Department of Health that monitor uh, human health of where shellfish are grown and harvested. But this is an example of the classification charts, uh, region from La Valette to uh, Seaside, uh, south of Seaside Park, Island Beach State Park. Giving you an idea of the examples, you can visit their homepage to see other local uh, water uh, waterways throughout the whole state, uh, what their classification is for shellfish harvesting. Uh, the blue is approved for year-round harvest. The yellow, as an example, is conditionally approved. Some of the bacteria that may be naturally occurring, occurring are more prevalent in the, wind, in the warmer summer. So you see uh, November to April during the colder months are when you can harvest from the yellow areas and then prohibit it or suspend it in the red and orange areas as examples. So a uh, helpful resource and a uh, necessary resource if you're going to go out recreational and commercial clamming to keep in mind. Another one, of course, are the management measures for hard clams. Uh, I'll show the commercial and then the rec. Uh, the commercial, the minimum size is one and a half inches. There's uh, no daily limit, but you must possess um, a commercial license that you obtain through the Bureau of Shell Fisheries, NJDEP. Uh, you can only harvest with hand implements, uh, you see with rakes, um, or by manual bare hands without uh, even a rake in some instances. Uh, and everyone on the vessel needs to have a commercial permit uh, to participate in a trip where uh, commercial harvest is occurring of hard clam. In contrast, for recreational regulations, um, the minimum size again is one and a half inches. Each individual can have 150 clams per day. Uh, harvest is not allowed on Sunday, and you need a shellfish license recreational to harvest, uh, legally harvest hard clams. Uh, the, they can now be bought, bought online from the Bureau of Shell Fisheries, and uh, you can print it out or mail it to your house. Uh, the prices are quite reasonable. If you are a resident senior, it's $2. Um, and I believe uh, if you're a non-resident shellfish license, uh, that's commercial. Recreational is 20 bucks. So quite affordable. And uh, make sure you have your uh, in the know with respect to the water quality uh, parameters in your area of interest helpful maps from the Bureau of Marine Water Monitoring, uh, and make sure you have your license in hand to be in compliance. So with that, I'll pause to see if there are any questions uh, in the chat feature before moving on to summer flounder and striped bass. I don't see any questions yet. Okay. I have one from John Gregg. I'll read it out loud in case others can't see it. Okay. We know of oyster farms in the bay. Do you ever foresee the day when there will be a return of enough for naturally occurring native oysters that can sustain a recreational gathering activity, much like clams? I, I sure hope so, John. I think uh, quite a few folks, uh, the Mullica River estuary, so just south of and Tuckerton, a little south of the Barnia Bay system. 
uh, a focus of, of the partnership here, but still connected and of interest. Uh, that's the last remaining location with uh, noteworthy active spawning wild populations of oysters on the Atlantic coast of New Jersey. And from the protect, potentially from the spawning that's going on in the Mullica, seeing an increased por, uh, number of set wild set of oysters uh, throughout the Great Bay Mullica River estuary and also up to some of the southern parts of Barney Bay or Little Lake Harbor, um, uh, down in Beach Haven and other locations folks report. Uh, so that could be from the Mullica or it could also be from uh, the aquaculture farms where they're commercially producing oysters on their uh, commercial lease sites, uh, whether they're diploids or triploids uh, will dictate whether or not they're reproductively capable. But some of those oysters that are being grown commercially are also contributing to um, wild uh, production that are then hopefully setting elsewhere. So uh, with that and some of the research, if you listen to Dr. Christine Thompson, the last speaker in the series, uh, the restoration projects, hopefully through those three and, and uh, hopefully some positive environmental conditions, we do see uh, some increase in the wild oysters to one day have uh, something restored that we have uh, can have more recreational harvest than we do now. There is one question that came in uh, from Brian. He says, since there have not been any stock assessment surveys since 2012, are populations and allowable harvest based on catch? And then he also asked, has catch declined since Sandy? Interesting. So I, I am not the management of what I want to point to make here is the, the upcoming species of summer flounder and striped bass are much more data rich. Hard clams in general are data limited, not necessarily data poor in terms of the quality, but it's data limited. There's not my understanding of a, a strong, reliable quantification of how many hard clams are caught by recreational or commercial fishermen, uh, particularly recreational. The commercial, there's better data because when they're sold, there are um, dealer reporting involved, um, but it's really difficult. Uh, and I don't believe there's really reliable information on what's being caught uh, recreationally, which uh, limits the amount by which recreational and commercial landings are considered in the management. In addition to the fact that the assessment and the survey are now eight years dated, whereas a lot of the animals in that assessment and survey probably are not living anymore either. Uh, in some cases due to old age or being harvested. And we have a question from Greg. We have heard varied explanations for no clam harvesting on Sundays. Is there an official reason? Yeah, I've, uh, it's common folks do. Uh, it's, I, I believe it's a largely, uh, so the shellfish uh, fisheries are managed by the Atlantic. I mean, the Shell Fisheries Council through the, uh, which is, uh, guided by the Department of um, Division of Fish and Wildlife. The Atlantic Coastal Section will manage the Atlantic Coast, and then there's a Delaware Bay section. My gathering on that, Greg, is that it's, it's uh, been in place for a while. It was an effort control, uh, given that there was an increase in fishing effort during the summer, uh, particularly on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, uh, with the uncertainty in the population size and the harvest that we just I just described a bit. Uh, I believe it's there as a mitigation measure uh, in that uncertainty to reduce the potential amount of over harvesting uh, during the most popular days. I believe you'll probably hear some other uh, opinions or longer history on why that was put in place and remains. And uh, that's the top some of the top points that come to mind to me now, Greg. Okay, another question just came in. Um, this one's from Ralph, and he's asked, he says, we haven't addressed the puffer fish population. What is the current population? Are they in danger? Very good question, sir. Uh, I don't know much about them. I don't, most of what I do hear about them is anecdotal or reports from fishermen, and I shouldn't say anecdotal to discredit that by any means. Uh, a lot of our research and monitoring is driven by input from recreational and commercial fishermen. Uh, and I've been hearing, as you may well, or also share your input with me after in the chat feature, more an increasing number of the puffer fish being caught uh, in recent years than previously. Uh, that is a population that does not have a stock assessment, so it's even more data poor, uh, data limited. 
than hard clams. There's not a stock assessment, uh, and I'm not familiar. That's not a species that'll be uh, monitored by most recreational catch data programs either. So it appears they are increasing in abundance, but not a heavily studied species by any means. That those are the questions that I am able to see, and I think that's it. Okay, cool. I'll doing pretty well on time too. Good. I will. Uh, I'll jump in now to summer flounder and then striped bass uh, for the second half. So uh, sticking with, as I mentioned before, there are uh, hard clams are basically sedentary, just moving up and vertically within the sediment. Um, other species uh, that. Uh, will migrate seasonally and be present in Barnegat Bay. They're caught by particularly recreational, but also commercial fisheries, uh, migrate a further distance. And they are therefore not only managed at the state level, they're managed between the states, uh, cooperatively between the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, because uh, they, particularly summer flounder, are caught by fishermen fishing both in state waters and federal waters beyond three miles uh, by recreational and commercial fishermen throughout the Northeast. Uh, so, uh, and they are more not data limited. These are tend to be more data rich species, including summer flounder and striped bass that I'll speak about today. So what this schematic shows is the life cycle of summer flounder. Uh, I'll start with the red arrows Th that is, those are indicating the offshore migration of summer flounder, which starts in the fall. Whereas they migrate from estuaries, Barney Bay included and near shore waters. Uh, offshore to the red area, uh, which is believed to be their spawning grounds, their winter spawning grounds. So it can be 60 to 80 miles off the coast and uh, approximate spawning times are November through January that the summer flounder are uh, reproducing in the red envelope along the continental, continental edge. Their eggs and larvae, or if they're transported into the abyssal ocean, uh, have a very low likelihood of survival. Those that are, will survive best are actually transported to the coast by the wind and current. Uh, and the highest survival is believed to be the eggs and then larvae as they develop that make their way into our estuaries where they have suitable habitat and forage. Um, and actually they end up in the late winter, early spring in our estuaries. So if you find a juvenile summer flounder in Barnegat Bay in March or April, it was spawned that winter out on the edge and made its way all the way into Barnegat Bay. So it's it's interesting that winter flounder have a different life history. They spawn in the estuaries, their eggs are benthic, they stick to the bottom. Uh, so larval winter and summer flounder can overlap in, in space and time, but they came from very different places locally or afar. Uh, and then the cycle continues on an annual basis. Uh, I'll go over when they become sexually mature and then they enter into this migration pattern. There are some separations believed approximated by these red arrows where the Southern New England fish, those off New Jersey and south of us appear to be a, a bit separate in their grouping and their different migratory corridors. So the NOAA National Marine Fishery Service, they do research surveys to look and so do states and estuaries and near shore, but NOAA does surveys all throughout federal waters from uh, well, in the Northeast, also in the South, but from the Northeast, from North Carolina into the Canadian waters. What this is going to show is the area location of and center, uh, the, excuse me, the distribution of summer flounder during the fall. So this is the October period from 1968 to 2014. Uh, and it's going to show the hotspots. Blue are locations where they didn't catch any summer flounder. Red are the hotspots where they caught a greater number of fish per location where they did their research sur surveys. Hopefully this works and you get an idea of where the summer flounder in October, again, as they're moving offshore to spawn, uh, where they're found throughout the Northeast. And you'll see how it's shifted uh, quite a bit over time. Uh, we had and remained, uh, still have high abundance of summer flounder along our coast in the fall period, October. Um, but we see an increase and shift in their center of distribution to the north and east, where 2004 or five and so onwards, they are, remain off our coast, but the center of distribution has shifted north and east with 
more being found off Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and even quite a ways offshore in George's Bank. So this gives an idea of uh, the location, the distribution of the resource. Um, this shift has been impacted by uh, warming waters, uh, also fishery management, when and where fishing is occurring, uh, migration patterns uh, larger. At, we have, uh, according to the stock assessment, more large summer flounder uh, a lot throughout the region now than there were 20 years ago. As summer flounder get larger, they've been shown from tagging to migrate further and further to the north and east. Uh, so there are multiple factors that lead uh, to what you just saw in the distribution, um, but that's the broad scale look at uh, the distribution of summer flounder. Uh, a bit more locally, uh, the Rutgers University Marine Field Station Rumps is located at the end of Seven Bridges Road in Tuckerton, New Jersey. Uh, they've done uh, many uh, fish tagging studies over time. Uh, this study was by Sakadot, published in 2007. They looked at summer flounder migration patterns uh, a bit, again, south of Barnegat Bay, um, but uh, also connected and of interest to Great Bay Mullica River Estuary. They tagged fish with uh, acoustic transmitters, which are like easy pass for fish. And basically, with their tags, they emit a low frequency sound signal that are listened for and detected by the receivers. So you can think the transponder in your car and the uh, toll bridges, uh, toll gates on the parkway, and they're coded. So just like they know to bill you when you drive through, uh, in this case, they know which fish pass through and you get an idea of how they're behaving. They looked at the summer flounder behavior in the estuary and also compared it to trawl survey information that NJDEP Division of Fish and Wildlife had available from along the coast, uh, which they do every two months. Uh, so quite highly monitored in near shore waters as well. Boiling down their multi-year stuff, uh, it provides an idea of when and where, in this case, I'm showing the when, of when summer flounder uh, may be spending the most time in our estuaries. Uh, so they tagged fish in 2003 and they monitor them with the receivers that year and the following year. So some of the tagged fish came back the year after. So they showed homing behavior. Uh, you saw the migrations where these fish can go 80, 100 miles offshore. Uh, quite a few of them. You see uh, up to in July, 35 of fish that they tagged previous year were in the estuary. They came back to this basically the same spot the next year. So homing behavior in summer flounder, uh, pretty, pretty interesting given how far they may well have traveled to spawn. Emigrating is the time when they left the estuary for the occurring ends, the gray gives you an idea of the seasonality based upon this tagging study of one summer flounder are in our estuaries. Interestingly, in the second year, uh, the emigrating bars, you see, they actually occurred earlier, July and August, mostly, whereas a little bit later the previous year. Uh, and in this study, they attributed that to a, uh, a storm that came by. I believe a tropical storm came through in July of 2004. And as fishermen often see, after a storm, the fish can go down quite a bit, uh, scratching your heads, where did the fish go? But this is one of a few tagging studies, summer flounder and others that have shown uh, from using this technology that they can uh, skedaddle and uh, change their behavior uh, after a storm. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, now that we're moving into a more data rich species of flounder, we have the ABCs, abundance, biology, and catch. Um, there's uh, quite a bit known about the biology of summer flounder, but also a lot of gaps. Surprising number given how valuable the species is, but um, it's important to know the age of summer flounder. So uh, summer flounder are aged by their otolith. It's shown in the upper right. Uh, this is from a 13 inch fish. The otolith's a little more than a third of an inch. It's an, the inner ear bone. It helps with the balance and sensory capabilities of the fish. And they grow like rings on a tree, just like a tree. Uh, you see a tree, they put down daily rings, and then you can count how old the fish is based upon that. And here's average data to look at the age of summer flounder. Um, sorry, these are in centimeters. So 30 centimeters is one foot. Uh, and then we can move up the minimum size for summer flounder recreationally is 18 inches in New Jersey. So that's going to be about 45 centimeters. Those fish on average are about three years old. So they grow quite quickly, actually, in terms of a fish uh, in order to reach, reach the minimum size. And they are about a foot long, 30, 30 centimeters or 12 inches after one year. 
Uh, so uh, for a flatfish uh, in these temperate waters in New Jersey, they grow quite relatively quickly. It's also important to know not only when and where fish spawn, you saw the continental edge, but how old they are when they start reproducing. Uh, minimum sizes for wreck and commercial fisheries were originally based upon the size of maturity. You want to catch and harvest an animal only after, ideally, it has had the chance to reproduce once or more to replace itself in the population. So you want to know the reproductive potential and when you might be best to start harvesting them uh, based upon when they're sexually mature. These are the ovaries in actually a winter flounder. Uh, you see immature resting, and as they go to developing, ripe and ripe and running, uh, that's a female ovary filling with more and more eggs. Um, and based upon sampling fish caught in the fishery and surveys, in this case surveys, you get an idea of when they're sexually mature and reproductively capable. And summer flounder, quite interestingly, also they mature quite early. About 90% of them on average are reproductively capable by one year of age. Uh, and if we go back to here, one year on average, they're 12 inches. So um, uh, most of the, or really the majority of the fish caught by wreck and commercial, particularly wreck, are uh, at 18 inch minimum size, are sexually mature. So the stock assessment is very quantitative, quantitatively intensive for summer flounder. I think it's 500 something pages. Um, cannot certainly cover that here as a segment of this one hour session, but. Uh, some of the take homes of at least again, in this case of what is the perception of the stock of summer flounder throughout the Northeast is shown here. The black line is the spawning stock biomass. That's the estimate of the weight of mature males and females in the population. This dash line is the uh, target and this is the thresholds. So you don't want the spawning stock biomass to fall below here. If so, then the stock's considered overfished. Uh, you want to be above at or above this target. And uh, according to the coastwide data, we've actually seen the declining trend in the overall biomass of summer flounder in recent years, but it's still at a reasonably high biomass above the overfished threshold. threshold. Uh, it's pretty healthy in terms of biomass. Uh, these bars in the background are the measure of the recruitment. Or that's the estimate based upon surveys, how many age zero baby summer flounder are available on a given year. A couple things, uh, interestingly, some of the years when there were the most babies, they actually had some of the lowest numbers of adults in the population. Whereas now we have uh, some of the highest points of biomass did not result in a great number of baby or high recruitment. Uh, that's because of a lot of factors, um, scientific uncertainty and also biological where and environmental. There are a lot of environmental influences, temperature, ocean currents, uh, the zooplankton that larval summer flounder need to eat uh, that dictate whether or not a hatched egg survives, in this case, a few months or one year. Uh, not having a lot of fish and a lot of adult females is not uh, typically not enough and doesn't appear to be in this case for summer flounder result in a lot of babies. Uh, so it's interaction between the environment and uh, biology and fisheries management, uh, amongst other factors that uh, are involved in recruitment and also the abundance of the adults. In addition to wanting to know from a, a stock assessment, pulling out the Cliff Notes version of how we uh, perceive the stock uh, coastwide, uh, in addition to the number of adults uh, it's important to also consider the rate at which they're being removed from the population. Uh, the stock assessment goes back to 1982 and the most recent through 2018. Um, this bar uh, line with the uh, squares, that's the fishing mortality rate or the rate at which the fish are being harvested by wreck and commercial fishermen. And it's, it's below the threshold. So it's uh, considered a sustainable harvest. It's below the threshold. So, uh, and it's, once fisheries management measures were put into place on the species in the early to mid 90s, you've seen the mortality rate come down and stay uh, most recently below the, the threshold. So um, arguably, although there's a lot of socioeconomic objectives still to go, arguably there's been some successes in increasing the biomass and also reducing the rate at which they're removed to become more sustainable in New Jersey and uh, throughout the coast. 
So just showing this for some of, uh, I'm not gonna be able to go through all this, but here's some of the system to set fisheries management measures. The stock assessment comes out with uh, an overfishing limit or what you can harvest sustainably um, based upon the assessment. They subtract some due to scientific uncertainty. We're not perfect. Uh, and then they split it up between rec and commercial, 60% commercial, 40 rec. And it goes through a variety of phases at the federal and state level. Uh, and based upon historical involvement in the fishery, each state gets a piece of the annual quota. So there's state collaboration, and oversight from federal partners, NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service, um, that ultimately comes up with the catch limits and uh, then options for each state, which through conservation equivalency, Jersey gets their piece of the pie, so to speak, and then they can decide how they will, uh, the different seasons, minimum sizes, possession limits on the recreational side, uh, how they will meet that target without exceeding it. But again, uh, you can check out some of the information on the council and commission's website uh, to dive deeper into, the, into this complex process. So just showing the recreational regulations, if you are not yet aware, as we're uh, largely through the season here, can't believe it, uh, middle of August, but uh, in most New Jersey coastal waters, which would include Barnea Bay, uh, you're allowed to keep three fish per 18 inch minimum size and the season will run through September 19th. If you're fishing Island Beach State Park on the shore side and the ocean surf fishing, um, uh, there is uh, a reduced minimum size of 16 inches there and a possession limit of two. Uh, if you're fishing on the beach on the ocean side and Island Beach State Park, there's a similar um, reduction in the minimum size in the Delaware and tributaries. So I'll jump in now for the last bit to provide a similar quick, but quicker overview of bass. Uh, again, another species commonly caught uh, in northern southern parts of Barnegat Bay, particularly in the spring, um, that's migratory, but we also might have resonance, or we appear to have resonant striped bass of varying sizes, including hearing increasing reports of striped bass being caught in February and March, uh, Tom's River elsewhere um, in, in Barnegat Bay watershed. Uh, so it appears that there may even be some year-round migrants, but I'll show um, what the conventional wisdom is for most of the fish in the population. Uh, this blue area is the approximate distribution of what's referred to as the Atlantic coastal migratory stock of uh, striped bass being found in near shore waters, rivers, and estuaries throughout this range all the way up to northern Maine. And uh, within that, there are some um, that what's known as contingents, uh, some different behavioral groups of striped bass. Uh, the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries summarized the tagging research that's been done over decades. Um, the major spawning areas, um, the number one believed to be where most of the, the juvenile striped bass come from are actually the Chesapeake Bay. Number two currently appears to be the Hudson River. And there's also the Delaware River as the three primary spawning grounds. It appears that some, including parts of Barnegat Bay, maybe the Mullica River, and other states, there might be some satellite spawning areas that has been an area of increased interest and attention and research. Um, but these are probably the three biggest contributors uh, to the reproduction of the stock. So in the, in the winter, striped bass or in the fall winter, uh, some of them will over summer, you see the yellow arrows, um, will migrate up to southern New England and New England waters. In the fall, they migrate back down, and during the winter, the spawn in the late winter and spring in the inshore spawning areas I just identified. Striped bass are known as uh, to have partial migration. This is showing the, the large migration condor, uh, corridors. Um, and so fish that are found in, in Barnegat Bay, as I mentioned, there is interest and in research ongoing to see if they are perhaps reproducing and staying year round. Uh, there's evidence for fishermen that some do stay year round, um, but uh, unknown proportion, those that are caught in the estuary and near shore waters, they're part of also the this my coastal migratory stock as they migrate to and from the major spawning areas up and down the coast and visit the near shore and in, in estuarine waters of Delaware Bay, I mean, excuse me, Barnegat Bay. But uh, as I mentioned, striped bass are known to be partial migration where some are migrant and some are resident. So you can still catch them throughout the year. Uh, 
but this proportion will also migrate of long distance. Striped bass are also highly fecund. They produce quite a few eggs. You see the number of eggs produced by length of the fish. A 28 inch fish, which is the minimum recreational harvest size in New Jersey, produces about 1 million eggs. If you're fortunate to encounter a 50 inch fish, she produces over 4 million eggs each year. Looking at the age of striped bass, the minimum size uh, recreationally in New Jersey you can keep between 28 and 38 inches. Uh, the minimum size 20 inch fish on average is about seven, eight years old. Uh, but you see there's quite a bit of variability. Whereas if you, uh, an eight year old fish could be anywhere from 20 inches to 37 inches. Uh, the diamonds are the average, but uh, whether where they're reproducing, uh, where they're migrating to, what they're eating, uh, are some of the things uh, that all contribute to the variability. Uh, similar to summer flounder and striped bass, you also want to know when they're maturing, not only look seasons and locations, but at what age. Uh, so they also looked at the gonads of striped bass caught in surveys throughout the coast. Uh, the proportion sexually mature by age eight, which is 28 inches on average, uh, approximately 90% of them are mature. So uh, the minimum size for striped bass uh, recreationally, the majority, if not uh, the vast majority of them will be sexually mature, likely to have spawned and hopefully replace themselves in the population before they're harvested. Uh, again, that's important for short and long-term sustainability um, to have animals reproduce before you harvest them. Uh, a take home also again of striped bass. Uh, uh, this is a figure showing the same as summer flounder, a little bit different in color. The blue mountain in the background is the spawning stock biomass for striped bass. They only look at the females. Uh, so that's the weight in millions of pounds of striped bass throughout the whole Northeast, including uh, sampling that happens in Jersey waters um, that goes into the stock assessment. And you see there's actually been a decline of striped bass since around 2003. Uh, and that population, once some management and moratoria were poured in in the late 80s, population responded quite well. Champion is a, a success story in fisheries management. Uh, but there's been concern in recent years with the population trending downward, including below the threshold. So the stock's now considered overfished. The bars of recruitment, you see there's been some pretty low recruitment, but also some large year classes in 2012 and 2016 in terms of age one fish. So uh, you're seeing those uh, year classes, particularly the 2012, which is now going to be six years old. Those are those mid 20 inch fish that are around the coast, uh, undersized right now, but hopefully they'll survive well and uh, actually increase the spawning stock biomass. But uh, there are causes for concern based upon the biomass going down, some weak year classes. Uh, we'll see how the recruitment continues and survival for these other animals. Uh, but based upon the declining trend, there had to be a 20% reduction in the quota for this fishing year. Uh, similarly, also the fishing mortality rate uh, has increased since the population has been rebuilt and uh, more popular, uh, more people fishing for striped bass now than when they were really hardly uh, very difficult to be found. Uh, the fishing mortality rate is above the threshold, so stocks overfished based upon the biomass and overfishing is occurring based upon the rate at which they're being removed. Hence, the fishery managers had to respond with the, the coastwide reductions in the quota that went into effect starting this year. In New Jersey, we don't have a commercial fishery. The commercial quota goes actually to a bonus tag program that you might be familiar with. Uh, the striped bass management measures that would apply in most waters, including in, in Barnea Bay, is one fish at 28 inches to less than 30 inches, a slot uh, limit that was put in play. I think all the states have a similar slot limit uh, that are in place right now um, as a, a means by which to meet that 20% reduction to try to reverse this trend and help rebuild striped bass uh, back to where it was a few years ago. So uh, if you want to learn more about striped bass biology assessment and management or summer flounder for that matter too, uh, I didn't include this example there, but mentioning it here for summer flounder, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, ASMFC, they really have excellent uh, resources on their website. If you go to the, go to their homepage management tab, and you see all the species they list. They'll talk about the biology, the assessment and management. It's, it's largely one-stop shopping for information 
uh, similar to what I'm talking about today for these species. So that's all I had uh, right on time, but also a Q&A here. I'm happy to stay an interest, but just wanted to provide some information about biology assessment and management for species that are caught in Barnea Bay, have a wide diversity of biological life history, those that are sedentary like clams, uh, those that are more seasonally and in some cases long distant migrants uh, and residents within Barnea Bay, such as summer flounder and striped bass, uh, some of the biologic biology and assessment that's considered in uh, managing these resources and fisheries and locations where you might find additional information of interest. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, here's my contact information and I'm happy to take questions uh, as long as there are interest in time. Thank you so much. Uh, that was that was great. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came in. So one is how is the number of um, illegally harvested sublegal fish estimated and factored into setting size and bag limits? Good question. So I didn't go into great detail here on that, but uh, here's the flow chart with a lot of, uh, you know, different. Uh, there's scientific understanding that the tagging the surveys and so forth are not perfect. Um, and there's a, a, a cautionary buffer there, but things like what was just mentioned are called illegal IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, unregulated. Uh, there are some systems by which uh, there are some data collected on that, um, and also but input from industry enforcement and managers, which are all have committees in the NFC. That type of information goes into this management uncertainty quadrant, uh, where they do consider that uh, you have the catch limit. Uh, and that type of information goes into the management uncertainty and the, the catch target uh, accordingly. Okay, another question is, are you seeing less recreational fishing this year with the pandemic? Interestingly, there's quite a few indicators that uh, recreation might be at near or at uh, high, shouldn't say record, there's indication of very high levels of recreational fishing for certain species and certain segments of the sector. Uh, obviously, when there was the shelter in the pandemic a few months ago, not many people were fishing. That really hurt uh, the businesses, uh, particularly the spring season of striped bass, uh, tog as examples. But once uh, the shelter in place uh, restrictions were lifted, uh, in some fisheries, we're seeing a large increase in effort. Whether it be indicators such as boat sales, tackle sales, some fishing tackles hard to come by, uh, charters still keeping their patronage. So, um, there was discussions amongst the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission about potentially um, liberating the management measures if there were a uh, reduction in fishing to help mitigate the social impacts. But there's quite a few reports from New Jersey and other states that they're actually in some instances might be more fishing occurring this year than fewer previous years. Recreationally. So another question is, are there new fish species that are appearing in the Barnica Bay with the changing climate? Yes, I didn't speak with it today, but actually Karen had invited me to speak about that at a previous event that was impacted due to uh, the pandemic. But uh, I do do work on and many others as well on the impacts of climate change on our marine fishery resources. Uh, so we're seeing like the summer flounder shifting their distribution. We still have them here, but we are seeing uh, traditionally warm water species that may or may not have been here in previous decades coming up in increased abundance. Uh, some species that come to mind would be triggerfish offshore, uh, cobia, sheep's head, particularly there's a lot of sheep's head in, in southern New Jersey. Um, so uh, th those are some quick examples of adults that are being caught in fisheries. Uh, the Rumps Marine Field Station for Rutgers, they monitor larval fish at the end of Seven Bridges Road where their field station is weekly, year round for decades. Uh, and they're seeing an increase in larval fish, southern species, uh, seasonally during the warm times. Those smaller ones, most of them probably don't survive once it gets cold. The adults can come in, come and go. Um, but we're seeing even greater numbers of southern uh, species, traditionally southern species as the larval stage. Uh, but then also adults that are being caught by fishermen of certain species. 
Okay, this is an interesting question. So the point. Pleasant Canal has been around since 1925, long before present day environmental concerns. Has it been an asset to the health of the bay fisheries and would it be built or considered today as a plus or minus to the health of the bay? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, something that comes up often, let me see if I can recall input or uh, based upon it. There, there are, what I actually have heard most is uh, particularly from some of the shellfishes, uh, there were concerns that it actually had a negative effect on some of the shellfish species that were harvested up there, soft shell clams that were more common in the past. Um, but it also provides a migration corridor for some of the summer flounder that go into uh, the Manasquan River. Uh, and maybe also for the winter flounder, they have they come in short of spawn. It's well known there's still spa some spawning around the Antelope Bridge. Uh, actually, I don't know if those fish are coming in from the Barnegat Inlet or if they do come through the canal. Uh, some Tatog entered the northern part of Barnegat Bay through the canal. Uh, so uh, some some points there, but I actually have not thoroughly studied that. Um, I'm sure others have more uh, more local knowledge. So hopefully that was some helpful tidbits, but I'm not up fully up to speed with the impacts uh, and research that's been done on that. Okay, I think those are all the questions that I can see right now. So I just want to remind, do you see any um, ones that I missed, Doug? Actually, no, that was uh, illegal unreported catch I see there. Uh, Jim mentioned climate change. Uh, right. Yeah, actually, the ones I'm seeing at the bottom of the chat here, uh, redressed. Yep. So um, thanks everyone for the great questions. Thank you again, um, Doug. That was a fantastic presentation with lots of really cool information. Um, I did put um, a link in the chat to do evaluation, but um, all the attendees will get that in the thank you email as well. So please be sure to take just a couple minutes to um, answer those questions. And um, hopefully you can join us for the next Ask a Barnica Bay Scientist in two weeks with Dr. John Wenick talking about diamondback terrapins. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And thank you, Doug. That was great. No <laughs> thanks problem. For thanks taking, for having me. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to do it. <laughs> we appreciate it. Oh, me too. I enjoy it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, here's my contact info. Feel free to reach out anytime afterward if have something that comes up. Thank you. Great. Bye, everybody. Bye.